Um, I'm happy to be here to talk to you today. Um, the Idaho National Laboratory has been working on a program with the Defense Threat Reduction Agency and Scientific Applications Research Agency out of Colorado Springs for the last three years. That program is older than three years. It actually started, DITRA built a test facility in Albuquerque, and they did some initial GIC testing, ground-induced current testing, on a small distribution system with a couple of small distribution transformers. During the course of that testing, they were introducing DC currents into these transformers, driving them into half-cycle saturation, and then looking at the harmonics and losses that were generated from that anomaly. So that test basically simulates the effects of a geomagnetic disturbance on a distribution grid. They realized that in order to bring that closer to reality, they needed to step up and test on an energized transmission grid. At the time, they were using a small diesel generator as the source to provide the power to that test grid. So they stumbled into Idaho National Laboratory, and we are a Department of Energy lab. Um, we have a unique infrastructure in that we have 890 square miles of federal reservation. It's about the size of Rhode Island, and we operate our own utility grid. And we have 61 miles of 138 kV transmission. So I'm going to show you this, this uh, slide deck is mostly photographs. I'm going to try to keep this to the fundamentals and the basics. And uh, if you have interest in more, techno more technical um, reports, we ha we'll have those available here down the road. So the first thing, in order for us to be able to test on our grid, which has seven main substations, including several operational nuclear facilities. We operate the advanced test reactor. We operate the materials and fuels complex. So we develop new nuclear fuels to remove high enriched uranium out of research reactors in the stands, we call them, in order to replace that with low enriched uranium, which is um, less likely to be uh, made into a weapon. So those facilities are operational class 1E nuclear facilities, and we can't disrupt the operation of those facilities, and yet we're going to start introducing these anomalies of ground-induced currents on our transmission grid. So the photograph on your left shows what we call the real-time digital simulator. That is a system that was developed at Manitoba Hydro. Manitoba Hydro spun out, and they formed uh, this company, RTDS. It's now used worldwide, China, India. They use it for... Uh, doing dynamic simulation of new transmission and generation facilities. At Idaho, we use that. We, we develop a physics-based model that operates in real time of our power grid. We introduce the anomalies that we're going to uh, do during our testing, and then we are able to, to simulate the effects that we're going to see on our transmission grid in order to prove to our operational nuclear mission owners that we're not going to subject them and, and cause them to trip offline. So first we model. Then we come out to our test site. Now that diagram, the outlined odd-shaped block, shows our 890 square mile reservation. We've built 52 test reactors on that facility starting in the 1950s. The site was actually commissioned as the um, NTS, and we tested the Army guns after World War II. They were shipped south of INL, about 50 miles. Those barrels were relined off the battleships. They were shipped by rail to Idaho National Laboratory, and then we test fired those guns and bore sighted them. So that's why we have so much real estate. So th the inside. That loop shows our 61-mile transmission grid. At the bottom, which you probably can't see, that we have an area called Citric, which is Critical Infrastructure Test Range Complex. And to the right is the MFCTS, or test site, which is right adjacent to the Materials and Fuels Complex. In between Citric and MFC test site, we have 13 miles of 138 kV transmission. We're able to open that transmission loop and leverage that transmission line for these tests. So at the Citric location, we have loads, and at the MFC test site, I'm going to show you we've built a temporary substation, and that's where we actually do these tests. So this is the MFC test site. 
And I'm going to point to a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to point to the two uh, power transformers under test. And then I'm going to point to our test trailer or load trailer. These are the transformers. This is the load trailer. So the two transformers I pointed to, those are 138,000 volts on the primary side with a grounded Y winding for you electrical engineers. And the secondary side of those transformers, one of them is 13,800 volts, the other one is 2,400 volts. Those two transformers were installed in INL substations back in 1954 and 1955. They operated there for over 50 years. And then just based on measuring the oil, dissolved gases and moisture in the oil and insulation power factor tests that we performed, we determined that they were at the end of their suitable design life. And so we purchased new units and replaced those. But instead of salvaging those or throwing them away, we put them in a boneyard. Well, in comes DITRA and wants to do these, these tests with power transformers. So we hired a crane and a transport. We moved those transformers into location. We built a temporary substation, including all the ground grid and oil containment ponds and other features that we needed. We built that right under the 138 kV transmission line, which you see overhead. Now, on the transmission line, you'll see some bags. I'm going to point to one of them now. Those bags are associated with current transducers that we have on the transmission line. So we're injecting currents into the neutrals on the transformer, and then those currents propagate through the transformer windings, and they end up on the transmission line. So we're monitoring voltages on 138 kV, currents at 138 kV, as well as frequency and all the harmonics that are generated. We're also monitoring voltages and currents and frequencies on the low voltage side of those power transformers. And then inside the load trailer, which I'll show you a photograph of, we're monitoring voltages at 480 volts all the way down to 12 volts. So also we have um, in the bully barn in the bottom right, that's a UPS that's in there, uninterruptible power system. To the left of that is a 30 ton chiller. And then in, in the very back left, are three resistive load banks. So we're able to conduct these tests with both resistive loads, which would be like giant space heaters, as well as complex loads. So an industrial or commercial facility has a lot of complex loads. Those include variable frequency drives, pumps, fans, uninterruptible power systems. We have a whole bunch, like maybe a couple hundred computer switching power supplies inside the load trailer. That trailer was built, I think uh, Sarah Incorporated actually assembled that trailer for DITRA. And that trailer is designed to replicate a critical DOD facility. Now there's a couple distinctions. DITRA is interested in really providing the knowledge and information to protect critical DOD assets from geomagnetic disturbances. Industry or the electric utility industry they're interested in knowing what they need to do to protect their infrastructure or whether or not geomagnetic storms are a potential threat. So doing this test for DITRA, sponsored by DOD, we're able to leverage the results from these experiments to also potentially assist industry and the government in developing effective policy. The office trailer that you see there, 24-foot office trailer, all of the data acquisition signals that are collected through the data acquisition systems that we have distributed around the test site and at Citrix substation, all of those signals come into that load trailer, which is where Amber Walker sits, who's in the back there, and she can actually executes the tests. But all that all those terabytes of data are then recorded there so we can go back and review that data after the fact. This shows the inside of the load trailer. Um, we have uh, CPU loads are the computer switching power supplies I mentioned. We have a chloride UPS and an Eaton UPS. Now on the very left hand side, we have a hemp filter. Is anybody familiar with a hemp filter? Few of you are. 
That filter is installed at locations like data centers, call centers, critical DOD mission facilities, hospitals potentially, and other uh, critical loads. That filter is designed to protect against the E1 and E2 components of the hemp pulse. E1 is a very high magnitude, very short duration pulse. E2 is from like one nanosecond to one second. It's uh, similar to lightning is what we often refer to. Well, we know how to protect against lightning and we know how to protect against E1 by shielding electronics and hardening. E3 is the low and slow component of the EMP pulse, which is what is significant with geomagnetic disturbance potential impacts on the power grid. So the test we're doing is to simulate the E3 component of the, of the hemp pulse. Well, that filter on the end of that load trailer, we were able to do these tests and measure the voltages and currents and harmonics at the end use loads in that trailer with that hemp filter in the circuit and with that hemp filter bypassed. A key takeaway that we found when we do these injection tests, the harmonics we measured inside the load trailer were about 50% higher with the EMP filter in the circuit than they were without that filter in the circuit. So now we've got a filter designed to protect against one pro challenge that exacerbates the problem due to geomagnetic disturbances. <coughs> there were, the first year we tested, we weren't sure exactly how this was gonna play out. So we injected up to 128 amps of DC current into transformers that were loaded at approximately 10%. Well, most transformers that are out there are loaded at 50 to 80%, maybe even 90 to 95%. So we had light load on the transformers. The second thing, we, we wanted to lower the fault current that was available at our test site. So at the Citric substation, 13 miles away, we introduced an artificial impedance by putting two power transformers in series to limit the fault current at our test site and also to basically choke any harmonics that we were gonna send back to the rest of the INL operational facilities. There was one other change we did in the, the last year of testing over the previous year, and that was we tested a mitigation strategy, which I'll talk about a little bit, and then you'll hear much more about that this afternoon. So the device on the left is the Imprimus, neutral ground blocking device, which has been licensed to ABB. ABB is marketing it as solid ground. That device is designed such that if its control system detects DC currents on transformer neutrals, it engages a series of AC and DC breakers and it shunts those DC currents to ground and allows the substation transformers to ride through the ground-induced current anomaly. So think hospitals, law enforcement, critical DOD missions, um, critical substation locations. This is a hardware device that we tested to mitigate ground-induced currents and allow that substation transformer to ride through. On the right are Schweitzer relays. We had a bunch of Schweitzer engineering folks at our laboratory. They brought a bunch of their relays. They collected a bunch of data while we were testing. And Schweitzer is looking at developing algorithms that could be upgraded into firmware of existing relays, which are worldwide, that could potentially detect these same DC currents on the transformer neutrals. But instead of allowing the transformer to ride through, it would open the transformer differential and de-energize the transformer. Once the anomaly goes away, then that transformer could be re-energized. So you're protecting the transformer, but the customers will see an extended outage. Um, a couple of key points. Um, the, the second year of testing, we removed that artificial impedance that we introduced in the first year of testing so that we had a much more realistic test with full fault current availability at 138 kV. We also loaded the smaller transformer, which is roughly 3.8 MVA or megavolt amps. We loaded that transformer to 100% and the larger transformer, which was 15 megawatts, we loaded that transformer to 50%, both with complex and with resistive loads. So our loading was much more realistic. Our transmission source was much more realistic. Our results were much more realistic. And I believe 
uh, industry would accept the results of the more realistic test uh, much more readily than the first test that we did. <clears throat> One of the things that we found out is that the stiffer the source or the, the lower impedance of the source, the more harmonics the system can absorb without causing problems. So the first measurements that we made in year one were the harmonics were much greater than they were when we tested and much more realistic. So these transformers that we tested are all of the same design. They're core form, wide grounded primary, three-legged core transformers. There's a lot of uh, comments amongst the transformer designers as to which transformer designs are the most vulnerable. We have um, uh, shell form transformers, core form transformers, and auto transformers. High voltage transformers, 345, 500, and 765 kV, a lot of those transformers are auto transformers. We have not yet tested an auto transformer. That's one of our next steps. We're searching for an auto transformer right now. We would like to A, test an auto transformer similar to what we've tested the core form transformers. And then we would also like to heavily instrument a transformer on the core and in the windings for temperature and vibration and be able to uh, test a transformer to destruction. Power equipment runs on smoke. When you let the smoke out of it, it no longer works. So that was the stuff that was on the, the last slide. Are there are any questions I can answer? Let me, let me give you a, a microphone and so that when you ask a question, you can first identify yourself and then ask the question. We have time for a couple of questions. Introduce yourself, please. I'm Brian Chakotis. Uh, the question I have for you, that filter that you showed, it will work for E1 and E2. It will not work for E3 because it's essentially a quasi-DC signal. Uh, so uh, maybe a clarification is needed there. The other question I have for you, have you tested delta Y transformers where you can essentially break the incoming ground and pick up a ground at the site? Um, the transformers, that, well, first of all, your first question, the, e, the E1, E2, E3 uh, on the filter, yeah, I do understand that filter is designed to protect against E1 and E2 and not E3. What we found, though, was that the, the E1, E2 designed protection filter increases the damaging harmonics that would cause impacts to the end-use loads when you give it uh, an E3 signal. So it exacerbates the harmonics that we, that we were able to empirically measure. The timing of those two signals, the timing of those signals are separately sufficient apart, sufficiently apart so you won't have that interference in a real situation. Well, the pulse that we're injecting is eight seconds. So we have a one second pre-trigger, an eight second DC pulse, and then a one second post-trigger, and then we record the data during that eight second or that 10 second period. The second thing, the transformers we tested are both grounded Y high sides with delta low sides, and then we have a zigzag transformer and a grounding resistor to derive a neutral on the delta windings on the low side. That's not uh, all that common in the utility industry. Most uh, extra high voltage power transformers would be deltas on the high side with grounded Ys on the low side.